Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Jana Summers from TC Camp. She's our interviewer. And welcome to Dr. Amanda LeCastro, today's guest in Room 42. Dr. LeCastro has a doctorate in English and recently moved from her position as an assistant professor to take on the role as emerging and digital literacy designer at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research explores that intersection between technology and writing, including book history, dystopian literature, and digital humanities with a focus in multimodal composition and extended reality. Amanda serves as the Director of Pedagogical Initiatives on the Book Traces Project and is the co-founder of the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy and the Writing Studies Degree. Her publications include articles in Kairos, Digital Pedagogy, and in the Humanities, Hybrid Pedagogy, and Communication Design Quarterly, as well as chapters in Digital Reading and Writing and Composition Studies and Critical Digital Pedagogy. Today, Amanda is here to help us start answering the question, what happens when you bring transparency into big data and peer review? Welcome. Yeah, welcome, Amanda. We're very excited to have you here. Thank and you both so much. So, there's so much that we can talk about, but I wanna dive in and talk about your book that's coming up. And uh, I think you can find it already up for advanced ordering, just so everybody knows, composition, composition and big data, right? So tell us about this book. What got you, you and Ben, um, our co-editors in this book, yes? Yes, Ben Miller and myself, we both went to graduate school together at uh, the, graduates, uh, the Graduate Center at CUNY, which is in New York City, right across from the Empire State Building. Um, and it was a program that was one of the first to really be focusing on digital humanities at the time when I started my PhD in 2009, very few programs were doing DH seriously. So Ben and I were very fortunate to meet in that program and we both decided to combine our interests in composition and rhetoric and DH, um, which is even more rare perhaps <laughs> than the digital humanities alone piece. So yes, that's where we met and we have been working on projects together ever, ever since then being in the PhD program together where we founded the Writing Studies Tree. This seemed like a natural extension of our dissertation work. So stupid question. I'm notorious for asking stupid questions. So what is big data? That's a great question. And it's actually oh, okay, a good. pretty <laughs> controversial question um, because it different is. industries, right, have different right different size, <laughs> different categories of Thank data. you for bringing that up. That was, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, when you're talking about Amazon, right, their big data is a lot bigger <laughs> than what we usually deal with in the humanities. When we're talking about the humanities, we're usually talking about fairly manageable data sets. What makes composition interesting is a lot of times when we're talking about composition and rhetoric or technical communication research, we're talking about data that comes from programmatic assessment. So it can get fairly large. If you're talking about a large public university assessing all of their writing intensive courses, you're talking of hundreds of thousands of, of documents there. And then when you're talking about archival research and you're perhaps looking at you know, decades worth of um, documents, again, then you're getting into those real big data numbers. However, traditionally in composition and the humanities in general, we're looking at more like in the hundreds <laughs> of documents or texts, um, especially I think as a proof of concept, right? You might look at a, a, a chunk of data to dig into, to do some work, to find some conclusions, and then expand from there and add every year um, mm -hmm. to prove that there's actually a pattern happening. Mm -hmm. okay. so what kind of patterns, what kind of patterns, what kinds of things does someone who's doing composition and big data, what, what are you looking for? What do you find? That's a great question. And I think it varies tremendously depending on the researcher, which is why our edited collection, Composition and Big Data, actually has four sections because yeah. all four of those sections are very different data-driven um, analyses. And my work is actually looking at student writing. So I did a study for my dissertation of um, a decade worth of e-portfolios. So an e-portfolio is your traditional writing portfolio 
where students are producing and revising writing over time that's collected and presented as a, a process driven presentation mm -hmm. of their work. Um, I had three, over 3000 of them. And because oh, wow. they were electronic, they were all um, archived on WordPress, which was, is a very easy to use content management system. Um, I was able to data mine, collect, and study them. So with those 3,000 e-portfolios, which contained, you know, multitudes of student writing, what I was looking for is the difference between multimodal writing in the humanities and arts versus multimodal writing in the sciences and technology. Oh, so how do students write using images, videos, um, tags, uh, taxon, uh, taxonomy or a folksonomy um, that grew out of um, the affordances of the website? Um, were they using infographics, data visualizations? Were, was, were, were, there, uh, were they using the affordances of um, interactivity, right? So right. did they have comments open? Were they annotating each other's work in various ways? Did they have discussions mm -hmm. happening in these online spaces? Um, so I was really looking at how students write, but also how the language of the instructor's assignments, right, oh, either led to more or less of that kind of engagement. So I looked at low stakes assignments, those that we, you know, don't, don't put a lot of um, right. uh, weight right. in and grading in terms of assessment. And I also looked at those high stakes assignments, those like final assignments, more research driven, uh, long term writing projects. Um, and I compared the assignments, the actual assignment sheets, the language the instructors gave to the end results. Um, needless to say, this was definitely a mixed method research project. Yeah. It was qualitative and quantitative mm -hmm. and relied heavily on my disciplinary knowledge of, um, you know, pedagogical um, um, the scaffolding, mm -hmm. the, the very idea of low and high stakes assignments, but also different approaches to teaching writing across the disciplines. Um, I was fortunate enough to be an instructional technology fellow in my graduate program. So I worked with professors across all disciplines to help them integrate technology into their courses. So I kind of had some sense of the differences across the well, discipline and how they structured their assignments. Well, I imagine you would need to in order, because I mean, the data is going to speak to you, but in order to hear the data, lack of a better phrase, you need to have some kind of knowledge to know how to interpret it, right? Absolutely. This is perhaps why master's in data analytics is one of the like, you know, biggest growing areas of higher education, right? Because data itself is not very valuable. It's how we interpret right. it, right? And also the massive information. Also right. data doesn't actually exist in and of itself, right? We have to yes. curate, comb, refine, um, and organize that data, which is definitely the, one of the most difficult steps of data-driven research, right? You have to decide what you're collecting, how you're collecting it, how you're presenting that data, what you're taking out and what you're leaving in, which is an incredibly critical decision. And we know that a lot of what is left out is actually maybe more revelatory <laughs> than what is left in, in some cases. For more on that, I definitely recommend Data Feminism by Lauren Klein and Catherine D'Ignazio, where they really look at the bias, the inherent bias and in what data is and is not collected. Okay, okay. I was just going to ask, is it, does it, do, those who are doing analysis, are they following like the scientific method and full disclosure, right? Yeah, that's the entire last section of our book of composition and big data is about the ethics. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was really data research. See, like that whole section on four, I was like, oh, I want to read section. I can't. Well, the whole book looks great, but Thank section you. four looks particularly yeah. interesting. interesting. We have we had really phenomenal authors to work with. We were incredibly um, we we're incredibly impressed with the submissions that we got and yeah. um, the ones that actually made it to the final collection of the cream of the crop. But the um, what we did ask after receiving all the initial submissions, we actually asked that every single author and every single chapter add a section on ethics. No matter whether you were in the ethics section or not, right. we needed to address, the, address um, 
kind of what did you learn? What would you do differently? What do you acknowledge as being missing or broken or, um, in, or partial? Um, because all data-driven studies are those things, right? They're all partial. They all have mm-hmm. elements that are missing. They all have um, interpretive elements that are that reveal our own bias as, as a researcher. Um, yeah. Also the bias of our institution or of the, of the mm-hmm. location where we, where we scraped the data. You know, right. obviously if you're, one of our chapters deals with data from the New York Times, for example, right? The New York Times data is gonna be a very biased data set in and of itself. Yes. Because it's only what's published in the New York Times, right? Exactly. So um, those that every single chapter of this collection addresses that very clearly so that I believe they really speak to each other in that way. But then that last section focuses on it in a way that's talking about how can we as a discipline Mm -hmm. ask and answer some of these larger questions about... um, not only the not only the ethics of designing data studies and, and doing the work of data driven research, but also um, how that how it's applied, right? Mm-hmm. And that's um, mm-hmm. if you look at some of the wonderful work in the Digital Black Atlantic that just came out, for example, um, and in um, more global DH studies, you're going to see a lot of this, like not not just how the data is collected and interpreted, but then what are the implications? How is that applied? When we learn something about how students write, right, we're then going to take action based on what we've learned and who is impacted by those actions and how are those actions um, a- affecting groups differently, mm-hmm. right? There's really serious consequences there. And um, this is, of course, true in all disciplines and all areas of our lives right now. But I think it's very critical for us to think think long-term about the implications of data-driven research and what, what we're claiming is true and what, what actions come out of those claims. So we did actually apply to the Four Seas Conference this year to continue those conversations because as most of you know, publishing in academia is slow. (laughs) It takes a while. And so much has happened since the conclusion of the writing of these chapters. We wanted to, um, we wanted to expand and extend these conversations into some things we've learned in the last couple of years. Well, the subject itself is an ever evolving and growing. It's an organic thing. It's, it shouldn't be just stagnant, like once and done, right? So, Certainly. Society changes. We all change. We learn new things. We apply new things. So, and our access to data and tools to analyze the data are constantly evolving as well. And they're becoming easier to use. One of my favorite acronyms is um, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, right? Uh So before you had to have a lot of technical knowledge to do text mining, text analysis work. And now with tools like Voyant, really anyone (laughs) can do it. Um, All you need is a browser, right? And access to the web and you dump some words in and it's going to do some analytics for you. Um, And also programs like Gephi and the proliferation or the, the almost ubiquity of Qualtrics and other statistical um, uh, modeling programs that most universities now subscribe to, right? It kind of means that lots of people can do this work versus very few. And the first section of our text actually talks about how to teach students to do this work. Yes. And that's something that I think is really interesting is now it has become, um, you know, simple enough to access in terms of both the cost and the technical knowledge, right? right? That we can teach this in first year writing courses and in introduction to digital humanities courses at the undergraduate level. And then at the graduate level, you can really work some pretty serious data-driven research into, in, into graduate studies as well. Well, and I, I like that in that first sight, because, you know, it's like, it's like being taught how to drive a car, right? It's, <laughs> It's like, okay, so, you know, we're, we're like kids with a bunch of stuff we have access to. It's like, okay, well, let's teach you how to do this the correct way, responsible way, you know. Absolutely. The whole and thing let about me... surveillance and, and mining data. Okay, well, let's be responsible about it and how we do it. And there's methods and techniques. Yes. And let me tell you, so I am on a strategic team at the University of Pennsylvania that is looking to... Um, to build 
comprehensive programming around data-driven research. So we did an external scan of all, um, both our peer and benchmark institutions, but also um, any any institution that has kind of a digital humanity center or a a data-driven research center. Uh And we looked specifically for what kind of programming, formal or informal instruction, resources that universities were providing around data literacy. And there's not as much as one would think, right? (laughs) Um, Data literacy is incredibly important to everyone's ability to navigate our current world. And there's not a lot of formal instruction. There's not a lot of resources outside of kind of those blanket statements or um, those, those parameters where they, where a university will say, this is how we collect your data, or this is how we use your data, or this is how we suggest you protect your research you know, that is done while you're a part of the university community, but there's not a lot of the, the personal data literacy, right? Like how do I protect the data that's on my, te- my mobile device, right? How do I protect the data that's, that's being collected right now as I'm on the Zoom call with you, right? right? And how that's being used. Um, and we really start this collection in our introduction talking about that, how we are, we are constantly being data minds in every aspects of our life. And so are our students and so are our colleagues. And so is everyone, right, that's, that's existing um, in our world right now. And how the ability to read, manage, protect, and analyze that data is now an essential literacy for all of us, I whether think, we like uh, it or not. Yeah, I think, I mean, I really do think that the internet should have come with a training guide. Like, I mean, it really, because really that's what happens as soon as you plug in to anything that's electronic, then, you know, surveillance starts and it will happen forever. It's yes, at the away. CUNY Graduate Center, we had um, a lot of students who were very active in political protesting, um, especially when I was in graduate school. Um, the Occupy Wall Street um, mm-hmm. movement was happening act, like literal blocks from Black the graduate yeah. center. Yeah. So we had crypto parties where students would teach other students how to encrypt their data, how to, you know, turn off all the settings on your cell, cell phone that were that was collecting uh, geospatial information, um, how to, you know, use different IP addresses, etc. when you were doing certain activist work. And I think we're very, we were rare as a graduate program to do that because mm-hmm. of our kind of location and proximity to some of these global protests. But you will, I, I think we will start seeing more of that kind of literacy happening at all levels of education, hopefully all the way down, right, to I think most 13 year olds have cell phones now. I think Pew Research said something like 80% of 13 year olds have cell phones, right? So at that, even at that level, there should be a a data literacy built into the curriculum. I'm going to recommend one more text. Gregory (laughs) Donovan um, from Fordham University, his book is called Canaries in the Data Mine. And it is about youth and their use of social media platforms and how when we we can see indicator lights, right, the canaries, we can see indicator lights in that young population of what is potentially problematic in data collection and online spaces. Super fascinating work. He um, also did his graduate work with Ben and myself. He was part of our uh, cohort that we were really very much teaching each other these <laughs> these skills first, because again DH was so new DH was so very very new in 2009 when we were all at the graduate center together so um Gregory Donovan uh, Mickey Kaufman um Chris Allen Sula Ben Miller uh Jill Belli myself we were all kind of in a brave new world <laughs> pun intended, <laughs> um, <laughs> of doing this kind of data work for our dissertations. Um, and and Greg, uh, Greg Donovan's book just came out. Very highly recommend that work. So, but um, in, in academia, we're looking at, you know, we're, we're not looking at nefarious ways of using this data. Um, mm, <laughs> are we? Not, not Perhaps <laughs> the three of us aren't, but I wouldn't say that like exam proctoring 
uh, surveillance technologies. I'm not, I, I would, I can name several for-profit products that I think are absolutely, even though they're educational technologies, they're absolutely using data in ways that I would question the ethics of. So yeah. our, when, when we talk about transparency, oftentimes we don't know, right? What, yeah. What's being surveyed and, and what's happening with that data, right? We as individuals. Yes. Mm -hmm. We as individuals don't. And even when, if you are designing your own research study, you may need to make decisions that will weaken the efficacy of your study to prioritize responsible research. For example, in the study I did for my dissertation research, I told you that I looked at, you know, student writing. So I actually made the choice to eliminate gender and racial designations from those students. That obviously weakened the claims I could make, right? I was, I was missing data. Um, I, I extracted data, right, um, purposefully. Um, mm -hmm. that's, you, these are critical decisions that are made about data that's collected that the, the people who are providing the data don't have any say in, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. if I had chosen to collect the students, the gender, race, religion, what, you know, all sorts of other identifying information, I could have made claims about those students that they, and they didn't, you know, have a say other than the fact that they opted in to letting me use their, their work for the study, right? Hmm. Hmm. Right. Okay. But when we talk about transparency, because I think one of the, one of the safety zones, because I don't think gathering data, gathering big data from a lot of different areas, it's not going to have, it's not going to change. But I think one of the things that can change because conclusions are, are drawn by doing this data analysis and, and they make, uh, they force an argument one way or the other way based on this data. And I think that one of the safe zones for data collection is demanding transparency. Like, I want to know, how did you come to that conclusion? Right? Yes. Um, it, within composition and rhetoric, um, there is a very clear push and a very clear argument for actually publishing the, your data along with the, the research conclusions. So right. you write the formal academic article that does the analysis work and presents your interpretation, but then you right. actually provide access to the data set as well. There's a very famous controversy in DH that this happened um, where a researcher did provide their data set and then a different researcher ran the same study, you know, as presented in the, in, in the text and got different conclusions. Right. So this is what Richard Haswell calls rad research, replicable uh -huh. data driven research, because that's, you know, if you run the same data analysis twice and get different results, there's there, there might be there's a, flaw, a flaw in either your procedure or your data. Right. right. So I think that this is a really important um, new dimension and something that Ooh. it's actually very, very difficult to facilitate. So. Um, one of our chapters is about Rhetoric IO, um, which it was a platform to present the data uh, of researchers in composition and rhetoric. Um, there's been a, a many different um, kind of ad hoc uh, organizing of platforms through which to collect, present, and archive data. Right. But as of right now, if you're tradition, if you're publishing in a traditional academic journal or press, there's no place to put your data, right? <laughs> it doesn't come right. with like a little USB with your book for the data, right? <laughs> or something like that. And even if there's a companion website, it often doesn't have that data. So you're going to see a lot of open institutional repositories. So yeah. uh, CUNY's is uh, called Academic Works. My dissertation and my dissertation data is on that um, platform. Um, uh, Humanities Commons through, which was originally through the MLA and is now um, uh, being directed by Kathleen Fitzpatrick at Michigan State University is mm -hmm. another great place, but there's going to be an increasing number of repositories for data, not just the publications, but the data, the data themselves. Itself. Right, exactly. Right. 
And I think that's an important evolution that we need to have, right? Is, is state your science, your, back to the scientific method, sorry, psychology trained, <laughs> right? You, uh, you state your method and, you know, the, the synopsis of your conclusion and support all the supporting data because you're drawing a conclusion, which is interpretive possibly. Maybe somebody running it is not going to get the same, but if they run it, they can see how you came to your conclusion. And if you're wrong, then you can modify or if a modification yeah. needs to happen. I think, do you think, I think, tell me what you think, <laughs> it, it, we have to separate ourselves from I'm absolutely right. Oh yes, absolutely. We're offering an opinion, <laughs> right? An interpretation. Right. It is of course, based on evidence, right? right. We're, we have our evidence and we've done the research and uh, the historical review, the literature review, right? To, to contextualize the evidence. Um, but, you know, all of, all of these studies are still limited based on context, location, access, yes. et cetera. So one thing that, for example, I was interested in why I did put my dissertation data in our institutional repository is because someone could then take that CUNY based data. Here are CUNY students that are working in New York City in an honors program. It's a very you know, skewed set of data yes. and they can compare it to their I, data from their community college in Arkansas or their state school in California or their, you know, uh, their institution of higher education anywhere in the world, right? right. Um, so that it allows us to make comparisons and to increase our data sets by including others that have already been prepared. It mm -hmm. also, again, allows a lot of experiment in the classroom. One of the greatest barriers to doing data-driven work is like, what data are my students going to play with, right? Where's my sandbox of data that my mm -hmm. students get to explore? Mm -hmm. um, and that by making our data open access, we invite those kind of pedagogical forays into uh, data analysis because there's a data set ready to use. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think it's one of those we should be accustomed to always challenging past findings and challenging because things change we grow times change societies change thoughts change right so always challenging that and, and bringing it up but if if you don't see it how, how can you reach it right so having that open access I think is a great evolution Absolutely. And then, you know, one of our chapters is, for example, looking at the WPA list serve from 2017, um, I think 2017 to 2020, right? But like a very small little couple of years, mm -hmm. obviously, then that data could be compared to past, future, right? Different, right. different chunks of the, the same um, the same data set, but in, in different times, uh, collected in different ways. And that's also important, right? Because mo most often one researcher doing one study is going to select, right, a chunk of data and not look at all that there is available. Again, going back to the New York Times, right? You might look at New York Times articles in these two sections published in these five years, and that's going to be a massive amount of data. Huge. Yeah, huge. Right? You can't yeah. look at all of the New York Times from, you know, the entire historical archives, right? That's, right. that's almost, that's almost too big, right? For, for an individual researcher, and even, even a small research team to do. That's actually one thing I'd really like to talk about too, is collaboration. I think that we're going to see yeah. more and more collaborative research in the humanities, because this kind of research is best done through what Kathy Davidson calls, um, um, the collaboration by difference. So mm -hmm. when you're specifically collaborating with people that are unlike you, yes. or have a different perspective than you so that you're not reading your data through tunnel vision. Um, you're not, um, you don't have that, the blindness to what only you see, right? But instead you have a lot of different eyes on the data well, and, you have and a lot of different interpretations. Right. And here's the thing too, it saves you from that bias, right? Because we're all human, we have human bias. And to say that you don't have it is like incorrect. You do, everybody does. And when you have a lot of people involved or other people involved, you're seeing things from different prisms and in different ways that you, you wouldn't have thought of that are very revealing and interesting. And it can take you in ways that 
you on your own can't go. Um, the, the classic um, metaphor that Kathy Davidson uses, um, and I believe this is from Now You See It, her book, Now You See It. Um, she talks about the, the gorilla experiment where there's a, a group of students passing a basketball, half of them are wearing black shirts, half of them are wearing white shirts, and they pass the basketball back and forth, and you're supposed to count how many times they pass the basketball. And in the middle of the study, a gorilla, a person in a gorilla suit walks through the people playing basketball. And at the end, the researcher asks how many people saw the gorilla, right? And of course, the majority of people did not see the gorilla because they're so focused on counting the basketballs. Yeah. <laughs> so this, I believe Kathy Davidson calls it attention blindness, but it's when you're paying attention to one thing. And when you're interpreting data, you are, right? Yes. When you're interpreting data, you're looking for something. You have right. a question. You have a reason. You have to a question, question on your mind. Yeah, that's that cool. you're looking for. And <laughs> yeah, you yeah. miss the gorillas, <laughs> right? That might be walking through your data. Right. Um, but if you have a team of researchers with those different perspectives, someone is going to see the, gonna the see gorilla. That gorilla. <laughs> um, and that's really important. And that's why, all you know, despite maybe their previous experiences with group work, all of my students do, you know, collaborative assignments in my courses. Um, I strongly believe in graduate student cohorts and normalizing collaborative work in graduate school. I mean, the writing studies tree never would have happened if it weren't for Sandra Pearl enabling us in her course to work together as a team of 13 students to build that platform. Mm -hmm. This edited collection is certainly an exercise in collaboration, but if we really want to do serious data-driven work, it needs to be collaborative and modeled more off of the sciences where yeah. it is the norm to have multi-authored papers and lab style work. Yeah. And there is something interesting, and I'm just going to for the practitioners out there and those not in academia, yeah. this is part of that dynamic when you bring in a consultant from outside, right? Absolutely. And it's that mindset shift from, you don't think of your consultant as doing a task, your consultant is there to help you be better and do better, right? And to see what you're missing. And to see what you're missing. Like one of the things Liz is like phenomenally good at is asking questions. Like I never thought of that question, right? But that's, so just a little, plug about that's why you bring people in from outside. And that's why earlier when you said people who aren't in my circle, it's really important for all of us to push outside of our circle because there's a richness that comes and, and they're going to find the girl. I'm going to have to use that now. Find the, the girl, girl in the room. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Do you have a gorilla hunter? <laughs> right. The, um, the thing is, is that we are actually accustomed to doing those humanities through peer review. Right. Yeah. You don't publish yeah. anything yeah. without having so at least two other. Yeah. Yes. At least yeah. two other sets of eyes are going to look at everything you do. And we do train students to do this from that first year writing course all the way through their graduate work where they have, you know, three or four members of their dissertation committee. Yeah. But you always have multiple people read something before you put it out into the world. Yeah. Why we wouldn't make this practice more visible because that's very invisible labor, right? It's incredibly yeah. invisible labor. Your peer reviewers aren't written anywhere on that final text. They're not credited mm -hmm. anywhere in that final text. We don't even put no, our, our reviews on our CVs, right, in right. academia. But that work, mm -hmm. I think if we normalize making that kind of work more visible, especially in asking someone to re review your data set and review your methods, much like they do in the sciences. That is something that we could, um, I think actually the humanities would bring something to the sciences by mm -hmm. adopting those processes and, and talking about how they could be more um, ethical and they could be more critical. A absolutely, because I think here's the thing, and in, in, and in pr the practitioner's world, a lot of them, well, I shouldn't say it because I run into teams that aren't familiar with peer review. And it's one of the first questions we always ask, what's your peer review process? And we want to cry when we hear that they don't have one. Um, but you know, the peer review, it's, it's not a threatening thing. It's actually, it's a good thing because it makes you stronger, right? And when it comes into the science field, I think what they miss is the fact, you know, from a humanities perspective, we're taught peer review is going to make me stronger. It's going to make me better. They're going to find the gorillas for me. But in science, sometimes it's like, well, no, I have to be right. Yeah. And uh, that's, 
I don't think there, there are necessarily any right <laughs> answers mm-hmm. in the humanities. We're not really searching for what the right answer is, but rather we're, we're hoping to extend or expand a conversation or, or enter a conversation, yeah. continue a conversation. And that's what this, this collection, composition, and big data is really about starting a conversation. Um, yeah. Data-driven work has been done you know, since the 70s, since Janet Emig and Sandra Pearl were hand coding with highlighters on printed out transcripts, right? But there's uh, there's almost a renaissance of data-driven work that has been happening since the early 2000s, especially in the fields of computers and writing. Mm-hmm. Computer, if you look at the Computer and Writing Conference, um, you know, conference proceedings um, and, and the publications in that field like Kairos um, and Culturation, et cetera, you're going to see a lot of data-driven work starting in the, in, in the 2000s and increasing now, mm-hmm. which for me means that we do need to train students in peer review, yeah. how to peer review data-driven work. We need to start, start that experimentation process earlier. And yes. we do need to make sure that these interdisciplinary conversations are happening. Yes. And I think- um, Peer review- the- Oh, sorry. Peer review is hard for a lot. It's hard to go through, especially if you are thinking of yourself as part of the product. Mm -hmm. We had um, Tracy Nathans Kelly just last week. She says, you know, she's teaching people to separate the self from the professional deliverable, right? And your journal and your approach to this edited collection opened all of that up and changed things. Yes, which is intimidating, I think, to more traditionally trained academics. So at the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy, um, which we started at the CUNY Graduate Center in 2011 and is now international, we have an international team <laughs> of editors on there. Um, we, it's entirely open peer review. So when you submit to our journal, you um, are told who will be reviewing your piece and you work with them more in a mentorship model where that where the scholars in your field will be entering into the conversation about how to strengthen your work we did this specifically so that the journal would be welcoming to graduate students to early career um, academics but also to alternative academics and librarians and independent researchers and people outside of maybe the traditional hierarchy of higher education to make not only the, the, the product we're putting out more diverse, right, but also the voices that yeah. count in right. academia more diverse, yeah. right? We really want to signal boost some of those voices that get left out of um, more traditional academic publishing because we know that they have a lot to offer um, to these conversations that are happening, especially about technology and a more cutting edge emerging uh, research in these areas. Um, now that's very scary, right? When you, when you as a researcher see that these two maybe senior scholars, maybe, you know, rock star names right? <laughs> that you read and admire are going to be offering you criticism, that's intimidating. But we really focus on trying to offer like that constructive criticism and, and really um, making the work stronger which is ultimately everyone's goal, right? Uh, you as the, as the author, the reviewers, and us as the journal editors, right? We all want the work to be as the best it can be, right? The strongest um, product it can be. Um, in terms of this collection, mm-hmm. I think we took kind of a radical approach. Yeah. We did. Uh, most yeah. edited collections, you know, all the authors are working in isolation mm-hmm. by themselves. They produce the chapter. They, you know, submit it to the editor or editors. I mean, even a lot of edited collections are still single editors, right? In our case, Mm -hmm. it's two. And, um, you know, they make some suggestions, you revise, and then you get blind peer reviewers from the press, right? That offer more suggestions. But it's, again, it's a very, there's a lot of invisible labor. It's a lot Mm -hmm. of isolated labor that's very disconnected. Um, And the authors in in the edited collection might not even know who else is in that collection until it appears on their doorstep. Right. right you might not right, even ever right, know right. who else has contributed. They don't know who else is, is, is on the, the table of contents with them. Right. Right. Until right, it's right. actually it's complete. Um, 
what I think sometimes happens then is that you end up with an, uh, chapters in the collection that don't speak to each other, that, that you, know, you have a multitude of voices that are having individual conversations rather than that discussion that mm-hmm. seems to have a thread that ties them all together. So um, after reading all of the chapters um, and getting initial feedback from the press, we asked the authors to read each other's chapters. Now, we didn't ask all 17 authors to, act, to read all 17 chapters. That would be a lot of work. That's too much, yeah. Too much labor to, yes. to ask your well, and, you know, and if you're peer reviewing, how, you can't quality peer review 17. Right. So yeah, instead, right. we strategically partnered them with chapters we thought had clear connections. Mm-hmm. And we thought actually maybe should be citing each other. Mm-hmm. Right. So we thought like, oh, this chapter should really be citing this, this chapter. Right. Or these these two um, authors are really speaking to each other, but don't know it yet. Right. right? So we partnered yeah. them very thoughtfully in hopes of creating dialogue between the chapters. And it honestly worked so much better than we even imagined. And it, it probably <laughs> lightened the load for you and Ben. <laughs> well, we still we still edit it all every single time. Yeah, chapter, but I mean, but still. It, it, what it did was it now almost all the chapters do cite each other. Yeah. You're going to see the names uh, appearing again and again. So there's a very clear dialogue between all of the sections, but also the authors, the response from the authors was like glee and delight and joy. They love <laughs> reading each other's work. It got them excited to be part of, a part of the collection, right? Like they yeah. felt pride in the collection they were a part of because they were all the exciting work that they're the, the, their peers were doing it within the same, you know, binding yeah, <laughs> of this right? collection. Um, and it also, when we then got the, the, when the entire collection was done and they sent it out for external peer review, mm-hmm. um, we got the external peer reviewers who got, they were blind. So I, I, I wish I could give them credit. Thank you, blind peer reviewers. <laughs> they <laughs> said, it's so cohesive. This is so cohesive right? That this collection yeah. really goes together so well yeah. because these authors were, were, were working together, collaborative. So, and, I, and I think that's a great, because uh, believe it or not, our time well, is up with you at this meeting. You know, but I don't want to go yet. <laughs> but right, I mean, this is a very important point for practitioners. Yeah, yeah right? I, I really Practitioners want, yeah, all know me, each other. They all work together, right? So it is open peer review if they take advantage of it in the right way. Yeah, so one of the things I was going to say is one of it is a perfect place to end our conversation because yeah. what you've shown through this book, I mean, everybody should go get the book. Absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely. Um, and I like chapter four, I like section four and section one, yeah. section two and three are good too. <laughs> Trust me, I've seen the table of contents. I haven't gotten the book yet. You have but, the introduction um, though, which has, got preview. Which has the yeah. description yeah, of every but, single chapter. But it's yeah. not all the chapters, right? There's some really good authors in this. But one of the things that I think everyone should take home, practitioners, students, professors, everybody, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Peer review is not about criticizing and tearing down. It is about building up. And what is that saying with the rising, rising tide lifts all ships? lifts all boats, right? So it's that whole thing to collectively, if we collaborate, we're gonna be stronger. And if we are brave enough to open source our data process and how we do things, it will help you become stronger if you're doing data mining and researching. It just makes you stronger. Sure, somebody might come along and draw a different conclusion. Okay, take a look at that. Right. We have to separate the self from our work, like Liz pointed out. So I want to have, and I, don't, I think it makes, a, it makes our, it, it makes, it makes the work we're producing and the plethora yeah. of, of publications that we can produce stronger when there is dispute. Right. I yeah. think that the most rich areas of research are the ones that are the most contentious yeah, are right? the ones that are the most controversial <laughs> are those like emerging conversations that don't have clear answers yet. Right. Where we yeah. don't know the methods, where the methods are going, where they're going to lead us and how they're going to be developing over the next couple of years. If we don't have those tough conversations now, and if we don't, uh, if we don't actively disagree with each other and have these debates about what the right 
way to do this work is, right, then that's the really scary part, right? Like if we right? don't, we don't actively yeah. engage in this peer review to make sure that we're doing this in a way that is ethical, responsible, and again, thinking through the actions on the other side, right? How it's going to impact our field, how it's going to impact our students, how it's going to impact the the institutions that we're providing the interpretation for, mm -hmm. right? That's the real, that's the real fear here is that we, if we don't invite those diverse perspectives and that, that open, transparent and collegial <laughs> and friendly, right? Yeah. And respectful yeah. debate, constructive criticism, then, then we're, we are opening ourselves up to, um, colonizing right and to supporting yeah. the power structures that are already in place and that we are that we actively want to to reinterpret and reimagine nice absolutely to end it. well amanda i hope to have you back again this has been just a fascinating conversation i've yeah. really enjoyed talking with you and i can't Thank wait what so comes out september Right. Yeah, it's very early September. It's available for pre-order now. I think we might have one of our authors in the audience. So hi. Um, and um, I just want to say thank you so much to Ben Miller, um, to our wonderful mentors, and to all of the contributing authors to this collection. Because really, it wouldn't it wouldn't be anything without them. And they're all fabulous. Hi Chen. See hi Chen. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. And um, yes, please, uh, all the credit goes to all of these wonderful authors. <laughs>